Well, welcome everybody. Sorry, we're a few minutes behind. Uh, the previous session on AI needed someone to remind them that they're running a little bit late. Um, but we're happy to be here today. Thanks for, for uh, joining us here at OCLC. Uh, my name is Andy Bush, um, and I'm very happy to have Sean Duffy joining me today, uh, who's the, our product manager for end user services. I will be the first to admit that Sean uh, will handle all of the hard questions that you might have, because um, he's one of our, our product experts. Uh, but we're here to talk about Corio Insights. Um, so this past spring, OCLC introduced a new service um, called Corio Insights, which is a next generation analytics tool uh, and platform that enables you to look at your collections from a, a, um, a forward thinking perspective. Um, one of the, the joys that I've had uh, since the end of COVID and as libraries have started to open up um, is I've had the opportunity to go and visit and, and talk to a lot of librarians. And there are really two different things that have jumped out to me in a lot of those discussions. Um, the first is that libraries are, are making decisions about space. But they're different types of space decisions because, uh, first off, during COVID, a lot of libraries, and I was uh, up in one in, um, recently, created a lot of uh, new space within the library by making you know uh, what was outdoor space before into library space and, and building some, some new uh, roofs and, and uh, sessions so that students could sit six, six feet apart. And, and libraries are now struggling or, or talking about how do I best utilize that space? How, do, how does that impact my collection? How does that impact what I do from a, a, a perspective um, a collection development policy? The other area around space that I see a lot of it, and, and this kind of jumped out to me when I had the opportunity to visit the Hillman Library at the University of Pittsburgh, um, is they don't have, you don't have computer terminals anymore. Um, when we used to walk into, or when I used to walk into libraries, just about every nook and cranny within a library was filled with a PC so that patrons could search the web, the OPAC, their, your discovery tool, whatever it may be. Um, and that's starting to go away. And the reason for that is because students now have their own laptops, their own technology, their iPads, their iPhones. So again, it's opening up space within the library um, to do research and, and use it in different ways, collaborative learning and different uh, tools. Um, the second thing that I've noticed with a lot of the academic libraries um, is you're all preparing for the uh, FTE cliff that's coming here in the next couple of years um, and how to keep your institutions relevant within what could be a very challenging time. Um, great example of this is, is some of the out-of-the-box thinking is schools and universities and colleges that have been traditional subject area or business schools or, or liberal arts schools are thinking outside of the box and how do we attract new students um, into our institution so that we aren't impacted by that cliff that happens in a couple of years. My son's a senior at, at a business school in New England. And it was interesting because shortly after he started there, um, they opened up and developed a health sciences program uh, specifically for physicians assistants. Um, and I've, I've seen other programs around nurse practitioners and researchers and, and um, everything in between. But relevant to today's conversation, the really interesting conversation we had with that university was shifting from a business collection development mode to a health sciences collection development mode. Um, they had to look at institutions that use different classification systems um, and hire folks that had specializations uh, within those collection development policies and parameters. Um, sometimes comparing LC to NLM is not the easiest to do from a, uh, a classification system. But they really had to build out and decide how they wanted to build out their library to support the institutional goals and, and objectives. Um, so we've introduced uh, Corio Insights, which really simplifies the process of analyzing your collection, working with peers, and deciding how you want to build out your collection on an ongoing basis. Today we'll talk about four different needs that, that collection uh, Corio Insights uh, addresses. The first, we talked about collection building. Um, what do you want your collection to look like in the future? How does it compare to some of your peers, to some of your competitors, for lack of a better term, um, in the academic space? Um, I see some of our, our uh, partners here from, from Skelk, but uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, we're partnering with Skelk right now to actually use Corio Insights to compare the, the collections of uh, Skelk member libraries to those of HBCU and, and other libraries to see where there are opportunities and, and where there may be gaps in the collections from a diversity standpoint. So how do we build those out and fill some of those gaps in? Um, also about academic program alignment, which I mentioned. Uh, but lastly is collaboration. Um, so 
I've yet to find a library that sits across the table from me and says, my budgets are absolutely fantastic. We have more money to, to, to do than we know what uh, to do with. Um, what happens and what we're seeing is a lot of libraries and organizations partnering with each other on collaborative collection development um, to really uh, stretch the dollars as far as they can. So how do institutions that have similar um, strategies and similar programs work together to provide the resources that students need um, in a collaborative uh, uh, perspective. So without further ado, I'm actually going to turn things over to Sean, um, who's going to, uh, in the interest of time, we actually recorded a demo of Corio Insights, um, just because we knew we were going to be short uh, on time. Um, but everything you see here is live in the system, and we can show you either in the booth or we can set up some time afterwards to, to walk you through it. Hi, I'm Sean Duffy. CLC product, <laughs> a library analytics solution that uses World Path Holdings data to align library collections with institutional focus areas, curriculum priorities, and trends. In today's demo, we're going to walk through use cases for Corio, curriculum alignment using SIP data, and then a DEI-focused use case using fast subject headings. First, here's a quick look at the user interface. We have filters on the left. Your institution or group is designated by A, and the B is for comparator libraries. And here, you select one of four analysis types. All, showing everything that A and B hold side by side. Overlap, showing titles held by both groups. Distinct, see titles held only by your library. And gap, see titles held only by the comparator library. So, let's see how SIP data can support key academic programs that, for this demo, will help prepare students and workers for jobs in manufacturing. <coughs> we use the four-digit SIP code 15.06 for industrial production techniques slash technicians. If you don't know a specific SIP code, you can do a quick search right in the interface. OCLC has mapped SIP codes to Library of Congress classifications, so you can do collection analysis with the metadata that educators are more familiar with. We've set up a fictional OCLC university, and we'll compare against a fictional industrial tech peer group for institutions with programs we admire. You can also add filters by year, place, formats for scarcity, language, and more, if your needs are more specific. Let's run the all analysis first. On the left, we see totally unique titles held by either group. On the right is our entire collection. You can narrow results by year if you need to know who has recent materials or by other criteria to develop what-if scenarios. Now, let's look at the gap, since we need to know what we're missing to support these new classes and we'll make it for books published after 2015, which gives us titles for possible acquisition. You can do an analysis of those titles against your resource sharing groups, or export the list to share with faculty for discussion. Next, we'll use Fast Headings for a DEI project, supporting students and teachers dealing with post-traumatic stress. This might be for classes on the subject or for library users looking for helpful information. We can also drill down further using LC classes. These are just a couple of the many use cases of Corio Insights. The main thing to remember is that it leverages WorldCat data to provide you with actionable information based on your collection and your goals. And if you have an OCLC catalog and subscription, you can add this service in as little as 15 minutes. Thanks for watching. Right, to the un non cringeable mind portion of the <laughs> um, So Corio Insights gives you a lot of opportunities and a lot of jumping off points to get into your collection and really start to segment it out. As I mentioned in the video, um, the fast subject headings are a great opportunity to really explore those multidisciplinary um, topics. Some of the ones I've interacted with institutions are about our social work, the Middle East, um, artificial intelligence. One of my colleagues continues to do virtual reality. That's his go-to. But you can really capture these multidisciplinary aspects of these collection, of your collection and the peer collections you're comparing with. Um, you can look at LC classes, diving into, again, those big, broad LC classes, maybe the subclass, maybe specific individual LC ranges. Computer science is one that comes right to mind with that 76.76. .76. Um, one of the really big opportunities that Corio gave us was the opportunity to dive into a different way to look at your collection and the emerging curriculum priorities and aligning your library with those priorities. And that's where the zip code analysis comes in. So during the development of Corio, uh, OCLC got together with a taxonomy firm and we decided, okay, let's map LC classes to these zip codes. 
So now we, the library and the institution can now start talking the same language and start talking about degree conferments and seeing how the library can support those degrees. Um, you can look at your collection by world cap holding. So again, what's rare, what's scarce, what do, what do my peers have a lot of, what don't I have a lot of. Format, we do offer plenty of different formats. Publication date, again, looking for maybe recency or maybe not so recent materials. Place of publication, maybe you want to start searching for those big publishing houses like New York, London, or maybe you want to start to pursue maybe an own voice type of analysis and excluding those places and really capturing place of, uh, materials published in the places where they're talking about the subject. Languages, you can look at um, primary language or um, secondary language codes and really giving the opportunity to dig deep into those multilingual um, works. So maybe you're a global institution and you need to have multi, uh, multiple languages in your collection, great opportunity there. You also have the opportunity to overlap with authoritative title lists. And at the end, I do have something very special to share with you. Um, print circulation usage as well for our WMS customers. So now I'm going to talk about some of the use cases. So Andy mentioned Skelp, and they're a fantastic partner coming up with some really cool stuff and really pushing Corio. The next couple of cases I'm going to talk to you about are from some of our current customers and some of our beta partners. I'm trying to be cognizant of time here. Um, so this is from uh, Lila Darpenzi. He is associated with the University of Berkeley. And what he's trying to do with Corio Insights is real, UC, the UC system is really splitting out their collection and really specializing in certain area studies. So um, UC Davis gets one, Berkeley gets another, um, San Diego gets another. So Dr. Penzi, what he was doing is he was using Corio to get down really, really niche into certain LC uh, subject range codes. And he was getting very specific about Slavic studies. So he was really trying to make sure, hey, do we have the latest materials? Who has these materials that we might be missing? Um, this next one is from Dr. Wilma Jones. She's from the College of Staten Island, part of the CUNY system. So this was a really kind of cool one. And so what she did, she was one of our beta partners, is they were using Corio Insights to apply for a DEI grant to get materials for their institution. For those of you unfamiliar with the College of Staten Island, uh, they're on Staten Island. There's really no way to for their students to leverage the borrowing of the other CUNY libraries. They have to get on the ferry, they have to then go all the way to the library they want to borrow from, then they have to come back, then they have to get back on the ferry, then they have to get back to their institution. So really difficult to try to do that. And so what they were doing is they were using Corio to find gaps in certain popular title, DEI titles, to support their population. And so those students didn't have to travel as far and try to leverage that with their busy schedules. This last one's really cool. So um, this one is from a UCLA librarian who is doing a essentially a subject, large look at um, Islamic law. So what he did is he did a, um, a, fa a fast subject heading search on Islamic law collections across 14 North American libraries. He basically wanted to know, how does this look? What's the spread? And so he looked at number of titles by library, <laughs> libraries by unique title, titles by country of publication, and then he looked at the titles in the top five languages. So really getting a sense of, okay, how big is the Islamic law collection in, the, in North America? So really taking a deep dive here. And I left the little link below, but you can search. If you just Google um, Islamic law blog, and you can find him, and he mentions Corio in there. And he was, he was a very interesting use case to work with. So if you're looking for something maybe a little bit more out of the box. And then finally, just um, the other day, we just released a custom title list upload feature. So now in Corio, if you have specific identifiers, such as OCNs or ISBNs, and you want to start comparing maybe um, faculty generated lists, certain DEI lists, certain subject area lists. Into, with your collection, you can start ingesting those into Corio and performing those comparisons. So it's really easy to do, it takes a couple of minutes, and it's very asynchronous. So you'll get an email notification as you upload a list, so you can continue to use Corio. So with that, do you all have any questions? Sure. Two questions. So. My print collection has shifted. My collection in general, I got 120,000 print. Yeah. And when I just did my, my stats at the end of in the summertime, I've got about 300,000 ebooks now. Yes. So how do I do an analysis comparison with this? Because there's stuff where I'm like, I don't know what I have. And also, once I get the gap list, how do I then <laughs> get those items so I order them? Those are two good questions. So that next step. So I'm going to answer the second part first. So Corio does let you export out all of the data that you um, run your queries against. So you can get a nice list with all of the various pieces of metadata that you'll need in order to make an acquisition decision. So you have that option. And then with your second one, so 
if you do decide to purchase Cora, we always encourage you to do a streamlined holdings um, project with OCLC to make sure that your holdings are up to date. And it's super quick, super painless, takes a couple of days to a couple of weeks, real easy to work with, um, and it's free. So the second part is with your e-resources, we always encourage you to turn on your holdings for those and making sure those holdings are on. And then you also have the opportunity, to, so when you're doing your comparison, the matching in Corio is done via the OCLC number. But we have the opportunity to also see how the work, the OCLC work ID, which rolls all those individual additions up to a major work, and we can leverage that as well to make sure that, hey, are you missing some gaps? Are you missing, um, maybe you have an older edition, you can see that in Corio as well. The matching is done on the OCN, but we can show you work level stuff as well. Um, same time, oh man, oh, let's start. Okay. Um, price range? Um, I, would I mean, I'm a, we're a prep school. Okay. Uh, which is different than all y'all. <laughs> um, so, uh, but we have, we're an OCLC customer, we've been an OCLC customer since 1992. Um, so we've been around a long time. Yeah. I would so, say. Stop I would say, by and ask for a quote. Yeah, yeah just yeah. OCLC I don't know what off the top of my head. You can come by the OCLC booth, or we can give you a okay, cool. Perfect. Okay. Uh, I would just Google this, but don't have internet right now in here. Do y'all share your uh, SIP to LC class crosswalk? Not at this time, but we are. <laughs> we can talk potentially if we want to have a conversation about that. Thank you. What would you use it for? Just yes. out of curiosity. <clears throat> what you use it for with your APIs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? But also, I mean, oh, yeah. to your point about just talking to administrators on campus. You know, yeah. Like, yeah. No, definitely. And um, if you're actually looking for um, a resource around that as well, I can actually let me come talk to you right after this. But um, University of North Texas, they are using it for um, comparisons with some of their collections as well right now. So they're using court. They're one of our Corio customers, and what they're doing is they're assembling various reviews about specific academic programs. Because in Texas, you have every 10 years, you have to review <coughs> academic programs to make sure everything's in alignment. Yep. So they're using Corio to help work with that as well. Cool, thank you. Yes? Um, is there a finite number of comparator institutions that you can kind of have, or is that unlimited? Um, It's unlimited. It's okay. just, it's um pretty high, but yeah, it's, it's it can be high. Okay, thank you. <laughs> questions. Cool. Thank you all so much for your time.